I keep forgetting to do that. We should have one soon. We haven't had one in too long. All right, so we wrote a paper on uh, vacuum tubes versus transistors, right? Tell me about it. What, 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 what new stuff did we learn? Last time we talked about transistors, right? Go ahead. That, uh, vacuum tubes can handle a lot more electricity than Okay. Okay. Uh, was that good or bad? I didn't think of any use for it. Except for consuming more power. Right. So. Well, I mean, except if there's like a surge of power, it's not going to break as easily as a transistor. Okay. So uh, maybe things based on older technologies are less uh, susceptible to uh, uh, fluctuations in power. All right, which maybe means that with transistor stuff, we need to kind of protect them in, in some ways. That's where surge, uh, surge uh, suppressors come in and uh, um, uh, battery backups do even more uh, than that. But, they, you know, they kind of uh, maintain a, a charge as battery backups will actually always power the device from the battery. And then the battery is what's actually getting charged and they're less susceptible. What else we got? The transistor is smaller and uh, flexible. Flexibility, you know, less power. And, uh, okay, so acid. a lot smaller. I mean, we looked at, uh, this last time, we looked at, um, you know, effectively big transistors. We looked at uh, uh, transistors that can be used for, like, prototyping circuits. But when you design a transistor at the uh, VLSI level, very large-scale integration, you can print transistors onto a circuit board, and they, you know, take up a very, very tiny... Uh, is footprint. This, is this a smaller and less electric consumer and probably less heat? I mean, I think that's probably almost always true. I can't think of a situation where that's not true, where uh, uh, the, the, the smaller the device and the, well, smaller is probably not necessarily the important part, but the less electricity something requires to run, the less heat that's likely to be generated by it. It's probably a true statement, yeah? Um, what I found was, like, the only tough place that... Uh, the vacuum tubes were kind of used still as like in our satellite system yeah. and then our uh, radars and uh, I think it had to do with like ra radio and stuff where there's a high voltage. Okay. So that kind of goes back to what he was saying where, uh, well actually also what, what he was saying about the um, susceptibility to sp spikes in energy. Okay. Um, so they're still used today. Okay. Is it only because of high voltage? Is it also because some of these things have been around for a while? That multiple, but all right, go ahead. Also, vacuum tubes would uh, short out after a couple hours of use. Okay, of uh, sustained. Yeah. Sustained, sustained use. use. Yep. And they were very unstable. Okay. Uh, we're probably better at building them today if we are still using vacuum vacuum tubes in some applications well, the today. Vacuum tube is still used as a microwave. Use a microwave. Okay. Like a like like a, a microwave where we cook stuff. Yeah, but I don't think that's related to the. Is that related to the? Like, are they using that to? It has the programming of the microwave. Well, it has to do with the evolution from vacuum tubes to transistors. Oh, tell me about that. Bring <laughs> <laughs> that up. Um, well, what happened was. Forget what his name. Well, they, these people uh, started to create the transistors. They figured that there was a, a better way to do what the vacuum tube was doing. So then they created some way to do it. And they created basically like a solid state switch that I think failed the first time, and then they had to go into and do it again. Mm -hmm. I read something up on it, and then. Uh, so one of the things you might have read about is kind of the predecessor to something called a flip flop. Yeah. Does that sound familiar to you? Flip flop. That's a kind of a switch, switch type thing. They still exist today. We'll talk about them when we talk about static RAM. You're not off the hook yet. Keep going. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so then they, I don't know. They created the idea of a transistor, and then I don't know. That's kind of where they got to. And then there was the point where it was so much smaller that they realized that they could probably make it even smaller and then that's, it just came, consistently got smaller and smaller as, up until today. 
Okay, so what was their original motivation? So we have these vacuum tubes, and they're solving a problem. I mean, the, the vacuum tubes did solve the problem. What was the biggest downside to vacuum tubes? Size and heat. Size and heat. Um, really, I mean, heat's always our problem, right? So, but for the most part, size. We had, by our standards today, basically computers that could barely do anything that were taking up the size of a gymnasium. Okay, so we had a motivation to be able to do more with less space because space is at a premium, right? You know, if, you, if, if you're already ta having something that takes up a gymnasium, um, you know, and you want to make it more powerful, well, you can't just build a second gymnasium. That's not, that's not the solution, right? You know, we, we got to that solution to a point, right? We started off in the corner of the gymnasium where we were able to do something with like two bits. And then we said, oh, well, we want to do something with eight bits, well, now we're at a quarter of the gymnasium, and <laughs> we want to do something with 16 bits, and we want to be able to actually add some numbers. Now you're at a gymnasium. <laughs> okay, you don't just build the second gymnasium when you want to multiply. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we can imagine that the computers would get kind of out of hand then. All right, so we had a motivation to come up with ways of doing the stuff we were doing in, in, in smaller space, right? We do that today. I mean, that's, isn't that a, a look at our uh, video game consoles, Right? You know, if you, if you take a, a new game console that comes out and you fast forward a year, typically something like that, uh, you usually get the same console in a smaller footprint. Right? They've come out with uh, a, you know, a more uh, efficient processor that gives off less heat so they can make it a you know, smaller form factor or whatever it is. Right? That kind of stuff. Um, and I think, I don't know if it's out yet or coming out soon, the uh, 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 new, like a classic Nintendo. Have you seen the thing for this? Yeah, it's sold out everywhere. Okay, so it's out now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you know, it's basically the original Nintendo with I don't know how many how many games come on like twenty, like 30. 30 games. Okay, so you know with the original Nintendo, yeah, if you wanted thirty games, it was you know a stack this high of games, right? Each game was that thick and you know that wide, and you put it in there and you pushed it down and it kind of stuck in there, right? Okay, but now. You have, the new Nintendo is like, what, like a, an eighth the size of the original. It's this little tiny thing, and it has 30 games built into it, okay? And you figure it probably is pretty cheap for them to make if they already had the licensing for the software. Because you didn't have to put a whole lot of horsepower into that guy to, to mimic the Nintendo, right? Um, so, you know, you, you, you have something like that. So that's, that's taking, what, how long, what, what year did the Nintendo uh, come out? So I'm guessing maybe, uh, uh, let's see, 1990 maybe, 89, earlier? 1983, 1983. 80, yes. <clears throat> 1983, oh, I remember the day I got my Nintendo. Uh, actually, I wonder what, it, I bet that was like the Japanese release date. Wonder... Oh, the Famicom, that was the, the wasn't, it, wasn't the, Nintendo, the Japanese one called Famicom? Yeah, that, that, the NES was released on 1983. 1980, oh Getting old. North America, 1985. Oh, huh? I, mean, I remember that morning. That was the year the Bears won it all. <laughs> yeah. Sports. You don't, you don't remember 85? Why? <laughs> all right, so. Um, yeah, so the Nintendo was, uh, you know, a, a big deal. But, you know, that, that we've seen the miniaturization even just during, you know, our, our, the relative recent, you know, history uh, for us, that things get more powerful and get a lot smaller. You know, we've seen it with our cell phones, and, you know, they, they're ten times faster than they were ten years ago, and they're, uh, the screen's three times larger, and the battery life is eight times longer, and, you know, they have the same form factor, but just thinner or something like that. Yeah. Something else that I was reading about was one of the cons of the trans transistors is that they're constantly changing and they're getting smaller and smaller so that um, the issue is if one would go out you'd have to replace bas basically the entire board when a uh, vacuum tube goes out you just replace that one vacuum tube. Okay. But what's the rate of uh, Well yeah, what's the rate of failure? But, but there, there's, there's truth to that, especially if we have something that's susceptible to, to static electricity, right? Um, so, did any of you read anything about like uh, EMPs or anything like that in part of your research? You know, because that's kind of a, uh, from a technology perspective, maybe a big fear on uh, you know the attack. And, and, you know, if somebody, you know, whether it's a terrorist attack or something like that, you know, an EMP pulse 
where uh, most people are fine, don't even know what just happened, except the people with pacemakers or something like that, then, you know, it's, uh, it's not good. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, all our computing infrastructure goes down, electricity systems go down, everything's down, because all these things today are based on transistors, which are very, very susceptible to that type of attack, right? Um, so you just mentioned that replacing, if we have one transistor that goes bad, basically the entire uh, piece of hardware is a dud, right? It's, it's, it's busted where, you know, we have stuff with vacuum tubes in it, which might be far less powerful, but you replace one bulb and you're, you're back in business. Um, now, having said that, you know, uh, an EMP pulse would probably take out vacuum tube based things as well. Uh, but you might be able to get back in business by just replacing the vacuum tubes. So it's possible you have a better rate of recovery or, or something like that. Um, okay, anything else interesting we found out? What are weaknesses of transistors? You mentioned one, that uh, you know we've miniaturized them to the point where uh, they're not really repairable, right? So, uh, um, you know, if, if something goes bad, whether it's... Uh, you know, especially now in today's circuit boards, we get things printed so closely together that, I mean, they're basically, if, at, from the, if we were looking at it in a microscope, they would look like they're almost touching. So from a human eye, they are touching, right? And uh, uh, so at some point between heat and crossover, you could get an interference where a transistor is damaged just from normal use. You know, you, we run into that problem uh, um, you know, you mentioned about uh, o overload of energy, right? Okay, so uh, if, for example, how many of you have had a uh, wireless router or something like that in your house that after f four or five years you had to replace? Just kind of stopped working right. Why? What happened with it? Huh? Yeah, but a lot of times it's not even, uh, it, it sort of still works, right? Yeah. Isn't that kind of the frustrating thing with with the, those wireless routers? Is it just kind of becomes flaky? It doesn't just stop working. Like yeah, you're just not quite sure if you can trust it or not, right? It's because time Warner cables sitting on the other end. <laughs> just <laughs> flipping, flipping the switch. You have but you have problems with Time Warner? Every single day for my the entirety of my life. Really? I pay for sixty megabytes per second. I call. I think I call no, you know. once a week. Yeah. You pay for sixty megabits. What did I say? Megabytes. Whatever. No, I specifically said I want bytes, not bits. Well, you don't get that. <laughs> okay, so you pay for 60 megabits, and, and what happens? Or maybe you get that an hour on a day. Okay. There's, like, just terrible. We've already had someone come out. It's clearly a congestion issue because it's just, like, basically every night, every morning, just, like, a megabyte per second, megabit per second. Are you sure your source that you're – I mean, obviously, if it's, if it's one megabit, there's plenty of sources that could feed stuff to you at one megabit. But, you know, there's, uh, it's not that common for there to be a source that you can actually get 60 megabits from. Well, I don't care if I'm not getting that, but I should be getting at least 15. If I'm getting less than 15, I'm rioting. Uh, oh, well, but, but even then, it depends on the source that you're going to. You know, if, if you're downloading from Apple, let's say you're downloading a file from Apple. If I'm doing speed tests, I should be getting... Maybe. When I run, like, four different speed tests on eight different computers... Well, but when you're downloading from a... idea of how much my speed is. The, 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 you're right, to a point. But if there's a bunch of people hitting that speed test server at the same time, the way speed test works is you download a file. And it measures the average speed in which you're getting that file. Well, the speed test .net, um, yeah, so whatever one, you know, whatever, whatever speed test you're using. Speed okay, whatever. Yeah, so that guy, you know, that guy... He's an internet connection somewhere, right? <laughs> and he has a he doesn't have unlimited outgoing bandwidth. That's why there's like a billion of them, and I choose the one that's closest to me. Fine, no, no, I, and I get it. I, I'm not necessarily saying that your speed that you're wrong yeah, in your I speed, but you know, you, your speed could be 60 megabits per second in terms of capability, mm -hmm. but you might only be able to get 30 from this source mm -hmm. because they only have 90 to give. Let's say. Um, you know, their upload is your download. So they might only have 90 megabits to give, and if three people are hitting it, the max you're going to get is 30-ish, right? Some, something like that. So you are at a risk of um, getting a false positive with how fast your internet's supposed to be. Um, realistically, from a single source, 
how fast does their internet really need to be today from one source? Depends on if it's Netflix, it needs to be a bazillion. I don't know if that's true. What's the streaming high quality video? Yeah, so if you're downloading 4K uh, over Netflix, I think that uh, the stream requires 10 megabits per second for 4K. I think they recommend that you have a 30 megabit per second or better internet connection, but I think in terms of maintaining the 4K stream, I think it's either 6, 8, or 10 megabits per second. So then why would somebody go out and buy these 60 megabit per second internet connections? Multiple users. Multiple users, multiple applications. You're streaming Netflix in this room, you're streaming Netflix in this room, you're playing a video game over here, um, you know, all sorts of different uh, sources. So when you add all those applications up, you're getting something like 60, 60 megabits per second. Does that make sense? Yeah, so really when you go to the broadband, or the, what they call wideband internet connections, you know, the chances of you getting 60 megabit per second from one source, pretty slim. But what are the chances of me getting less than one megabyte from every single source that I try? Oh, it's not rare, source. rare. So I mean, realistically, you probably do have a problem. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just saying that your expectation should not be 60 megabits from one source. So it's 60. Not, but it's not. 60. I don't want to have any lag. So in my 60 video megabits games. of 7.5 megabytes. Yeah, I don't want to have any lag in my video games, Netflix. Uh, lag games. is a whole different problem. It, it, you know what I mean when I say lag. It, and of course, it's an entirely different problem, but it, when across all of those, I'm having issues. I can't do anything, basically, on the internet. Like, okay. Basically, it's like I'm back Do you have latency back. issues at the same time? Like, if you're on one of your, if you're on one of your video games, um, because there's two, your ping. All of a sudden, what will be happening is I'll be playing video games. Everybody in the house will be doing everything normal, right? And then, like, just something will be, like like nine o'clock will roll around, and then my video games crawl to just a terrible slow, and there's buffering everywhere. Okay, so. but so the 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 quite if there's buffering everywhere, like on Netflix, and it's probably bandwidth. But uh, do you notice a, uh, an issue with, with uh, your latency or your ping on some of the games? Like if you're playing first-person shooters, yeah, a lot of times they have a, a measurement. Yeah. I know like if you're, you know, if you're getting 14 milliseconds, that's, that's you're fine. And all of a sudden it spikes to 3,000 milliseconds. Server, isn't it? They're oh, right. that's round trip. Oh, okay. Okay, because games like that, there's our, there's our robot. A telepresence robot. See that guy? That was weird. You haven't seen that guy? I have. Yeah, so it's it's he's somebody's controlling him. He's off to the races. Where is this guy going, though? Well, he must be checking out the lab. <laughs> go pick him up. Go go grab him. Pick him up. <laughs> put him in hand. I should log in and hijack that thing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did that in Walls last night in the master's class in the bank. During our break, he took it and took it out in the hallway and started chasing someone. <laughs> and started talking. Oh, hey, we're do it. <laughs> it's in use. Oh, uh, Josh is using it. Okay, hold on. It? It's a telepresence robot. So, like, we had a meeting today where uh, the computer science department from Ann Arbor remoted into our uh, robot. If you haven't seen this, go ahead and leave for a second. We'll go down to the lab. There's a, a, a robot down there. If it's not in the lab, it might be in the classroom down there. I'm not sure, but. So you want to come over and fix my internet, then, or what? Uh, well, I'm trying to help you debug what your internet problem is. I know what my internet is. It's not me. I know it's not I'm not. I, I, I believe you that there is a problem. Yeah, no, I, what you're describing it's is clearly, like, yeah, I'm just trying to go through the, the debugging process of is it a, which aspects of it are good. If you never see latency drop off, if you're always getting the 14 yeah, milliseconds or something like that, that's round trip. So a lot of like your first person shooter games, you're not dealing with a whole lot of data. So you're dealing with little tiny packages. So it's here, 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 like that. So, you know, you're sending, because you're getting constant updates where different people are. But, you know, the, the update is but 90 I bytes or something, yeah, right? Well, latency doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, I guess. Well, mine's so you're telling me, let's say I play Call of Duty and it has minimal data that's being sent, but the latency is excellent. I can probably play that on a 2 megabyte per second connection or not? Oh, easily. Way less than that. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a problem with how yeah. 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 over. Easily. Do you have problems too? I, do. I get 22 oh. ping on Counter Strike play. I think there's a problem with the yeah. 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 how yeah. I check. I have 50 megabytes. Megabits. Megabits. Two megabits. But it's not accurate. But it's not accurate. You'll confuse people. It goes all the time better. Like, and then after the day, they, you know, check it on the street tag, and they have 30, 
and that's with nine. 30, 40, 40, I only have 40, 10 megabit, megabyte per second. So. Oh, you now, now you're just using them interchangeably. Megabit, megabyte. Megabit bytes. Yeah, megabit bytes. Then after what I what I call the tablet, what was he doing? What was he doing with the robot? Just testing. Uh, I I usually could take this thing over. Not if it's in use, right? Well, I don't know. I thought I could. <laughs> Maybe it's if it's in use for my own account. Because yesterday what I had is I had an issue where it like uh, we've been having some network connectivity issues. We're talking about this in here, uh, where it drops signal. And then I had to restart, and then I had to get back in and take it over. But I think it was because I was still officially logged in. So, all right. So, um, what was I talking about? Oh, well, we were talking about several different things. But the, um, yeah, the punchline is is that uh, when you're dealing with wideband internet connections, you're, it's a shared experience. So you want to look at what your. Uh, I tried to take over the robot; it wouldn't let me take it over. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I know he has it, but that doesn't mean I didn't want it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so uh, it definitely sounds like there's a problem if you're having buffering issues. If you have a 60 megabit per second connection and Netflix has buffering problems, there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, you get a... You, it's got to drop way down because you got to consider Netflix also has multiple stages, right? If you're trying to stream 4K and it can't get the bandwidth for 4K, it'll drop down to... 247. Just, yeah, I, yeah. You, I look at it, it's just like three pixels on my screen. Right, but if so if it's dropped down to 240p and it's still stalled, there's something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, there's obviously something wrong. Yeah. Um, and have they they've come out and looked at it? Yeah, they already came out once. And then I keep Is that when you get trapped? Oh, we'll just reset it. I'm like, well, now it's fixed, so I guess you can hang up the phone now and give me a $10 print on my account. We'll do this yeah. next week. Yeah, I wonder if they might, if you have a low signal, they might need to put a, uh, um, a booster. And the tech guy who came out to do the line the first time before I moved in, he ran it through a door frame. So if you close the door, it like closed on the wire. <laughs> I was baffled when I saw that. Jeez. Did you let them know that? Yes, I told them that. I was like, I don't know if he was drunk when he came out here or what, but he ran it through a door frame. And they were like, well... Shouldn't have done that. And I was like, no. Nah. I mean, is this like a nice place? Do you do like live outdoors? Uh, outdoor. No, it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do, you, hey, do you live like outside? Yeah, it's just hooked up to the box. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tent. I mean, there's no, there's no sides, yeah, but there's a roof. It's one. Door frame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think those aren't officially tents. What are the the canopies? The walls. Yeah, the things that just have a roof, right? The the four pipe spokes that yeah. go up and a roof, but no sides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you live in one of the under under one of those, I guess. It makes sense. Now I understand the problem, bandwidth issue. You're trying to steal internet from your neighbor. Yeah, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just don't understand. I had every time it rains too, it just drops. I don't know. It's bizarre. All right. Um, so ultimately, transistors better than vacuum tubes in a lot of ways, right? All right, uh, what's next? What comes after transistors? I mean, are, we, are we starting to hit? Quantum computer. Quantum computer. Well, so kind of quantum. Tell, okay, so tell me about this. Dude. Is that some stuff that came up when you were reading about transistors, quantum computing? Uh, you said it. Tell me about quantum computing. It's actually something we're going to talk <laughs> I mean, about anyway. I can anyway. tell you what I know about it, but sure. it, doesn't, it barely makes sense to me. I can just That's fine. That's fine. It's something we're going to end up talking about anyway, so let's so, get in the conversation. So nowadays we have a on and off, a zero and a one. And that's the only thing that it can be. With quantum computing, we are able to have like six states at any given time, mm -hmm. um, which means that it's like up, down, spin, uh, then a couple other ones that I forgot. And it's only at the point where we measure it that it boils down to an actual state. So for some reason, this is going to allow us, I mean, obviously now we have six, you know, states instead of zero and one to play around with so it you know triples you know however much to the amount of computing power we can do and i think that we've been making pretty good strides with it they just had a or not just had but a little while ago they had a breakthrough where they were able to simulate a hydrogen atom or something with like 99.99 percent of accuracy mm -hmm. which was like the test that they had to see if it was actually a working quantum computer or whatever okay yeah um 
Um, one of the other things that and we'll kind of touch back on this, but one of the other things quantum computing deals with is this idea of ent quantum entanglement, where when you have two electrons that are related to each other, it doesn't matter how far apart you move them, they're still related to each other. So changing the state of one also affects the other, no matter where they are. So it also gives, uh, uh, there's an application of it that can be long distance uh, communication, where you know you can have instantaneous you know, you know take, take, taking your internet connection as a uh, as an example. What if you had a quantum relationship? So you had um, um, you know, we'll simplify this. Let's say you had a hundred electrons in your house, all right. And at Netflix headquarters, you had they had a hundred electrons that were entangled with your hundred electrons, okay. And let's say it only takes a hundred electrons to show a, a picture, okay. Well, now all of a sudden, Netflix doesn't have to stream stuff to you. They just have to make those electrons turn on and off, let's just say. Um, you know, move through their various states, and yours will, m will marry to it, will match. Instantaneously. Because of magical voodoo in between these things. It's a, a quantum entanglement is something we don't necessarily understand, but we're able to measure and see that it exists. Kind of an interesting... You know, an interesting subject. So the idea of quantum computing is space becomes less of an issue because we can store the c computation units anywhere. That makes sense. Plus, the computation units are uh, tiny. You know, these can be, you know, and as we get better at it, you know, the ability to break atoms down. These are subatomic particles that. So all of a sudden, you know, who cares how small? You know, if we're talking about transistors, and we're uh, representing a single zero or a one with a transistor, and we're going to start talking about memory, we'll probably begin the discussion today, uh, and then we're going to be talking about four different kinds of memory between, you know, like solid state, dynamic RAM, static RAM, uh, that kind of stuff. So we'll try to understand how RAM is built, how memory, different memory systems work. Um, but we're going to see in there, uh, especially with, oh, here it comes, coming back. Hey! Picture on that or no? Yeah. Frozen picture. They show the video? I think he might be testing because it's not. It's not Josh, is it? Who is it? No. Because we. One thing we were. One thing we're testing is how can we share something else because we're going to start using that to help with the uh, tours when people come visit. You know, uh, uh, Freddie's going to go and visit them. Yeah, uh, that's Freddie, by the way. Dr. Locklear calls him Scotty. That's not his name. Mr. Gonzalez named him. It's Sir Frederick Concarne III. Okay. So that's... <laughs> so I'm starting that trend. His name is Freddy, or you can just call him Concarne. Either one. Right. I think beam me up. The thing is called beam. It's a... All right. So uh, now when we start talking about memory, so this is more, you know, foreshadowing, if you will. Uh, when we talk about uh, DRAM, which is our slowest kind of memory, we've already talked at the high level that system RAM is slow relative to other kinds of memory, right? Fast relative to us, fast relative to hard drives, but system RAM is, is relatively slow. Um, well, uh, as a general implementation, DRAM, every bit is represented with six transistors. All right, we'll talk more about how that actually works. So, to represent a single zero or a one, we need six transistors. Now, as we looked at, you know, we talked last time, and you guys wrote the, shut up! I, just, I saw a flash of fear. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, actually a little embarrassed. He's like, yeah, that happened. <laughs> It's because it was his fault because he's a dumbass that doesn't know how to get rid of the action bar on a stupid app. So, a question. All right. So, <laughs> do they still, you guys still do that in the dorms? A little. Really? Yeah. Man. Yeah. I like, yeah, apparently they, they mimic me in the dorms. It's a, it's, it's a, I mean, it's like a, it's like a trophy kind of, right? Yeah, it's flattering. It is. All right. <laughs> 
All right, so what was I saying? Oh, six bits. Uh, so, uh, one bit is represented by six transistors in our normal kind of generic DRAM model that we'll, we will talk about, so you don't have to remember that right now. Um, but if we were representing six, or uh, representing one bit with six vacuum tubes, amount of the, you know, what's the space of that? That, okay, one bit, six vacuum tubes. Eight bits, <laughs> we start getting... Now you start realizing why it takes up a whole gymnasium or something like that. Okay. Now, for us, we can get um, our transistors down to a very small size, but not at the, uh, you know, the, the subatomic level, right? We can only get them so small. So the, the number of bits that we can represent in, you know, let, let's, let's say we have a one inch by one inch area. Okay, our, our processors are actually smaller than that because most, when we look at a processor, most of what we're looking at is, is heat dissipation. All right, but let's just say we have an inch by an inch because we can work with that. All right, so the number of bits that we can work with in an inch by inch uh, area is the, let's see, so that would be the number of transistors that can fit in one inch squared divided by six. That's the number of bits we can represent because we need six transistors to represent one bit. And part of that is to support read-write. We'll talk more about that, but you don't want to... Um, in order for this bit to be represented, um, you have to maintain power. And we'll, I, I kind of want you guys to stumble upon that. We're going to start talking about that in a few minutes. But uh, you need six to kind of help stabilize that during read and writes, because during read and writes, you need some of those six to turn on and off to, to do stuff. Um, and you don't want to lose your data. Um, okay, so I wrote a couple of things up here. I wrote JSON and XML. Remind me what these guys are. Data representation languages. Data representation languages. Okay, and, and, and what do we use them for? Give me some examples of what we use data representation languages for. Representing data. <laughs> representing data. I knew that was coming. Okay. Um, give me a concrete example. Style sheets and Android. Okay, uh, so style sheets would be you know us writing a CSS file that has a bunch of XML crap in it, um, and uh, that gets read by our, our web page. Uh, you said Android layout, that's also XML. Uh, commonly today, a lot of APIs use JSON as their transmission language. So if they're sending information, let's say you uh, let's say you log into uh, to to uh, some source. Let's say it's Amazon, and you're using their API. Um, they might send you back a JSON document that has some, you know, information about the user that's currently logged in. All right, so that JSON document's going to have maybe first name and last name and, and maybe address, you know, some stuff like that. Okay? And it's, it's formatted data so that um, if we just have a, t a text document with a bunch of data in it, that data doesn't have semantics associated with it, right? So JSON adds semantics, adds meaning to the individual parts of the, the text. All right, so we use this to represent uh, d information so that we can pull the meaning back out of it when it arrives. So it's a way of us taking data and moving it from one place to another. All right, make sense? So and I want to take this back to kind of the generic where one of the things that we do in computer science is find using it is, is about using technology to represent things in different ways is we have to come up with abstracts. We have to simplify some real life problem and we have to abstract it uh, into a, a computing solution, right? So if I need to get data from this program to this program, I have to come up with some MacGyver solution to send data between these two. All right, well, first we need that connection. We can use this internet connection, whatever. So we can use the tin can with the string, which might be an improvement. Um, okay, but we have, you know, we have some way of communicating between these two sides, but now we need to decide how we're going to communicate over these two sides, right? And we've, you know, we're problem solvers in real life, so we've done this. If, if you have two people uh, um, uh, on the playground and they, you know, one, one guy wants to tell the other guy to come over here, what do you do? It's like, hey, come over here, right? You, you wave them over, okay? Well, now, how many of you do the, the, the paintball thing, the real, you go out and play paintball? You, sure. You've done that before? Okay, so if you, you know, let's say we're doing two-on-two -two paintball, and you saw your, your teammate over the other side, and you wanted to let him know where you were, would you say, hey, I'm over here? 
shot. Yeah, if you want to get shot, you, you bet. This got to be silent communication. That's when you start doing all the the signal things, right? Right. You know, same thing with like uh, you know baseball. If you come up with the, you know, with the signals for stealing bases and stuff, you know, you don't have the third base coach telling the guy in second, okay, I want you to run right here. Yeah. <laughs> Although, when I was younger, the, the, they used to do that because they never believed I would steal a base. <laughs> and I could. Yeah, I was, I was, I had pretty good ramp up speed, plus the, the kid on the other end was kind of afraid. I was awesome at stealing home. You, know, you name a, you know, like a, a nine year old catcher that would stay on the tracks <laughs> when, when I'm coming. <laughs> People almost died because I mean, even back then I wasn't as fat, but I was big. I mean, I was, I was like, uh, I think I was six two in third grade. No, no, I wasn't that tall in second. I was, I think I was six two in fifth grade. Yeah, so I mean, I was always a pretty good size. Yeah, I was big. <laughs> well, I guess I still am, but it's really. How tall are you now? You're six four. All right, so you like my height. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I was always the I was always the the giant. It's weird genetics, I guess. I don't know. That was really good at stealing home plate. Is the punchline? Because <laughs> nine year olds are not going to stay on the tracks. I guess I must have been probably. Five, what grade are you in when you're nine? Second or third? Okay, I must have been like maybe five four, five six, something like that. Huh? Yeah, your height now when I was a third grader, right? And how, how much do you weigh? Oh, I weighed more than that at birth. <laughs> uh, my, my poor mother, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I ever weighed one thirty five. You only weigh one thirty-five. That's on it. That's an I, man. I guarantee one of my legs weighs that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have normal legs. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm still I'm still six four. All right, so we've come up with an interesting way. I, I got onto that by what you know, stealing base signal that people use. That was my little league coach. He used to just point at it because you know you got the big kid. I mean, if he's going to steal, he's going to steal. <laughs> so he didn't even try to hide the thing. But we come up with ways of communicating that aren't necessarily as obvious as just screaming across the playground. All right. So we needed. We had two computer programs that need to talk. We had to come up with a way of consistently sending information between those two computer programs. Well, initially we can have proprietary type communication, right? So uh, with proprietary type communication, we can use like a comma delimited list or a colon delimited list, or we can invent our own language, uh, Klingon or something like that. And we, uh, you know, so whatever it is, you know, you, you create some sort of structure for this program to talk to this program. What's the problem with a proprietary communication language like that? We want to separate this idea where we just automatically assume that proprietary is a bad word. It's not always a bad word. But what's the problem with, with uh, if we have a proprietary uh, language for this program to talk to this program? Yeah, it only works for that situation. If I have this other program that needs to talk to this guy, they need to come up with another proprietary solution. Otherwise, this guy needs to learn about this one. Right? So JSON and XML came up with, you know, the, the idea of these things is to create a consistent way of representing data so that any two applications can leverage the way that JSON or XML data is organized. They can change the kind of data they're sending. You know, maybe this program sends first name and last name over here, where this program sends, you know, age and height over here. Okay, so they're sending different information, but they're both formatted in JSON or they're both formatted in XML. So we give a consistent way of representing the stuff. Now, why is that? So now we're going to take this back over towards the hardware side. So when we talk about data representation in hardware, representation, what's the nature of our data when we're dealing with hardware? <clears throat> what's, the, what's the nature of our data when we're talking about storing it in hardware? Zeros and ones. Okay, and how do we store a zero and one? 
Okay, so so you're 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 a transistor, all right. Um, that would be kind of a a geeky thing to do. Like, what are you for Halloween? I was a transistor. I wonder if people would get it. Yeah, remember didn't Sheldon do the Doppler effect for Halloween? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> See, so she watches a good show. You don't. Yeah, because you don't have the bandwidth. <laughs> Even if I had all the bandwidth in the world, that would not be on the shows that I watch. You wouldn't watch Big Bang Theory? Terrible show. Like Big Bang all really? Day. Uh, we had this conversation before. Not funny. Yeah, I mean, he it says again. it's not funny because they have, to, they have no, to. I'm not saying it's not funny because they have a laugh track. I'm, just not, I'm saying it's not funny and they have a laugh track. I'm also saying that it's not a coincidence that a show. Oh, yeah, that's weird. So you have just have bad taste. Well, you can yeah. say that. Have you ever you watched it without the laugh track? Um, it's depressing. Is it really? <laughs> it is very depressing. Uh, it, might, it might be an interesting experiment. I, now, in, in, in your defense, my wife will sit there and watch reruns of it all day long. I can watch reruns of a lot of different shows. Yeah. Futurama, Scrubs. Those yeah, are I don't want to watch reruns. I, I find, and, and frankly, I don't find this season as entertaining. But in its heyday, let's say, kind of season maybe one through three, mm -hmm. we'll call it, it was a pretty funny show, but... The first time you saw the things, because you get that, those awkward moments, and you get the the, the you know the funny punchline, you know, with Sheldon doing something weird. But after you've seen it, it's no longer shocking. So it doesn't have replay value, in my opinion. My wife can just sit there and watch it because it has first time. Yeah, uh, you can just got bad taste. I think. I don't think so, dude. Hmm, it's weird. It's quality. It's I consume a lot of media. I think I. Good, good idea. Well, that. so I mean, you've basically been watered down. Your expectations are higher. Yeah, actually, that kind of goes it's an inverter there because if that was if it was watered down, you would pretty much just accept anything. Yeah. No. That really speaks to how bad you really think it is. <laughs> <laughs> like one time, I had a choice between like, Big Bang Theory and just turning my TV off. Yeah. <laughs> I turned it off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not like It's Always Sunny. Okay, I didn't like it. Still like it. I watched all of it. Okay. Still like it. I will not watch it. I literally it forced myself to sit through it. <laughs> yeah. Did you watch Breaking Bad? Oh, absolutely. So you like Breaking Bad? Gold standard for television. Okay. Absolutely gold standard. I don't. I don't know if I agree with that. I do. Brian Cranston. Whoo! Dude's the best actor ever. Although I will say, one of my favorite single episodes of any show was Box Cutter. Box Cutter? Which one's that? From, from Breaking Bad? Yeah. I know. Well, I'll just let you figure it out. Oh, when he, yeah, okay, I <laughs> I like Fly, the Fly episode. Oh, yeah, the filler episode, basically. Yeah, it was, yeah, kind of it was like a one-off. It was, didn't really have anything. He had a fly in the lab. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that was Yeah, I think those are stupid. And the finale. I thought the finale was nailed it. Nailed it. All right, so you mentioned that uh, with hardware, we represent zeros and ones, right? Mm -hmm. But how is that actually represented? We kind of think inside of the computer. You know, we've talked about all these gates and transistors and stuff like that. You know, when we were talking about uh, um, assembly language, we talked about registers and we had our, our uh, instruction set where we'd move, you know, this value, this, you know, we would represent it as a uh, decimal value. We'd move it into this register and then we can go and look at it. It looked like it was hex in our simulator, but... You know, under the hood, we know it's going to be a bunch of uh, zeros and ones filling that guy out. How are those guys actually stored? Black magic? Yeah, it is. It's black magic. Yeah. I knew it. It's the first time you got something right the first time around. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, under the hood, we have to, if we want to have a four bit number, you know, so let's say we have 1011, and that's stored somewhere. Well, you know, we just were, we're, we're doing a, um, a proof of concept here. Okay, so I want to store 1011 right here. How would we actually store that? We need to have a way of representing a zero, and we have to have a way of representing a one. So we talk about data representation in software. We can look at JSON. We can look at XML, those kind of things. Um, you know, data representation in real life, we have our normal English language or, you know, pick your favorite language, uh, or we have hand signals and stuff like that. We have ways that we can communicate meaning. Our meaning at the hardware level, 
we'll translate it later on into, you know, into a higher order of meaning, right? We took the zeros and ones and turned them into something that's more meaningful at a human level. But at the hardware level, we need to be able to represent zeros and ones. How do we do that? Okay, change this. Uh, for, for example. Transistor, you're changing state whether it's allowing electricity to pass through or not pass through, so that's changing the state of something. So okay. Do that in something that doesn't need electricity to be flowing all the time? Okay. So, at the end of the day, for us, I mean, all of our computers take electricity, take power, right? So, somewhere in there, the electricity is being used for something, right? We're not just plugging it in the wall because we'd like to spend money. Right, you know, we, the, the electricity must be doing something. We must be harnessing it to do something. All right, um, so a on bit means power is on. A one is power. A zero is less power. Not necessarily no power, but less power. So if we think about an individual, and this, it, depending on the type of memory, we'll get into more details, but let's just talk about the very high level initially. If we have, if we're testing the output of a circuit, and, and let's say the circuit's meant to represent a single zero or a single one. That's what that guy does. And we're testing the output of it. You know, we're not going to, you know, if we, if we think about this, we're at that level and we, we touch it. It's not that do I get zapped or not zapped as to whether or not it's a zero or one. It's when I get zapped, how hard did I get zapped? Was it more than 50 percent? If it was more than 50 percent of a zap, um, you know, more than half of a zap, that's as good as a full zap, all right? But if it's less than half of a zap, that's as good as no zap. Does that make sense? So we have wiggle room in there for how we measure analog versus digital. Because digital, we, we give um, on or off meaning to an analog signal. So we go back to, uh, let me put this in here. So, what do we know about analog? Well, we already have talked about digital. What's, what? Tell me about analog. It's a clock with the hands. Okay, fair enough. What What are some What are some things in real life that are analog technologies? Like speakers, amplifiers. Right? Um. Well, some of the older ones, yes. Um. Like speakers would always be analog. Yeah, speakers would always be analog, but some of your receivers are digital. Um, so there's a translation there. Uh, what about radio? Yeah, if you're listening to the radio, that's an analog technology. Um, or you're talking on the, the traditional telephone, the landline. Landline telephones are analog technologies, but radio is a. How many of you listen to the radio? At some point. All right, and we're talking normal radio, you know, like the you know, AM or FM, not 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 serious. Isn't it digital? Serious would be digital. Well, AM and FM are, are analog signals. I think they switched to digital because they, that's not how it works. Yeah. Then why? <clears throat> because what happened was my dad's in one of our cars, the uh, connection was a lot worse to the radio, and they said that we needed to go get a digital. Well, yeah, there, there's an inverter. When it comes in as an analog signal, you have to translate that into a digital yeah. signal okay. So because that goes through an amplifier, yeah. which then converts it back to an analog signal to so the speakers because the speakers, you know, they reverberate based on the amount of something coming in. You know, the more power that goes to it, the, that, tran that power is translated into sound. Yeah. All right, so uh, when you're listening to the radio, is, it, uh, uh, is the radio, when you get to a station, uh, is a station either uh, perfect or off, or is there kind of some middle ground there? Sometimes you get a little bit of fuzz, sometimes you just get pure fuzz, right? But, you know, sometimes you get really good reception on a channel, and then sometimes, you know, you can make it out, but there's some, there's some wiggle room in there. Same thing with, uh, you know, rabbit ears on your TV. Okay, so you got the rabbit ear stuff set up, and, uh, uh, you know, you can get kind of half of a channel, Right? You know, trying to watch the Packers game, and you, you kind of you got some aluminum foil on there, trying to get it just right, and you know you got the game pretty good, but there's a couple little squiggly lines in there. Okay, that's analog. 
Now, if you have, uh, uh, how many of you have Dish Network or DirecTV? You know, some satellite-based uh, uh, television station, television uh, service. Nobody? Nobody has those? That's really interesting. Okay, well, you, you know, the, what, what do they say? The, the problem with those is if there's, a, um, if there's a storm, not even where you are, if there's a storm uh, inhibiting the view to the sky between you and the satellite, uh, you're going to have connection issues, right? And since it's a digital technology, your picture is either perfect or not, right? It, it, not on. You, you usually you'll start getting like a weird pixelation thing as you're losing the signal, and then it just says no signal. You know, you don't get to watch half a channel on uh, on, on Direct TV because it's not the way the technology works. All right, so uh, analog versus digital, uh, and let's go. Oh, go ahead. Question. Um, so um, during the summer, my family and I would go up to Door County, and they in, in this cabin, just about all the houses have dish, and it's because there's like no Wi Fi, you can't get Wi Fi. Oh, for internet. Yeah. But does that have anything to do with the fact that they pick dish over doing something digital because of the fact that you just don't get coverage? Um, well, uh, no, but it's related. It actually related to what I was about to type here. It's uh, so I'm about to type so landline phone versus uh, DSL. So really, we actually can do this way. We can say dial-up versus DSL. So we'll stick with our internet connections. But to answer that question, um, when you're out in the boonies, uh, to get a, um, you know, you're, you're talking about their internet connections, okay? But it's just as easy to talk about their uh, television connections because they don't have the option of getting cable TV because there's no cables run out there. And it's not worth it, you know, when people live out in the boonies, you don't have high population density out in the boonies. You know, you got four people that live out there. So it's not worth it to Time Warner or to Comcast to run uh, fiber optic cables out to four houses. They'd rather just not have you as customers. I mean, that's how it works. So that's where satellites make sense because now satellites, uh, you just need to have a view of the sky. Okay? And the sky is kind of everywhere, right? You know, if you're if you're at some place on the planet where there's no sky, uh, well then you're probably at his place under the tent thing. Um, so I should have a sunroof, is what you're telling me. <laughs> if I want better connections. If I want better, you gotta get get, get the sunroof. Yeah, but I mean, if you want to make it, you know, weather resistant, yeah, I would I would say get like the screen door material. Well, plastic bags is what you're. Yeah. No, no, I don't mean that. I said weather resistant. Oh, resistant. Yeah, not weatherproof. Weather resistant. Screen door. Screen door, yeah, because what you'll have is you'll have a beat up effect before it starts dripping through. Perfect. Yeah. So you probably like coffee on top too is basically a French press. <laughs> well, actually, not probably not true. It's fresh pr French press. You need to have uh, a pressure. So the rain hitting it. That's pressure. What's the terminal velocity of a raindrop? Well, I mean, terminal velocity, well, it would it would be slower than terminal velocity in a vacuum because a raindrop isn't going to have, uh, will have resistance, even though it's small. Uh, is it a rhetorical question? Would you like to do the math? I do want to know, yeah. Could you, do, could you, instead of Googling it, I want you to do the math right now. Could, do you think you could figure it out? See, but see, that was a funny joke from from uh, Big Bang Theory. What? Uh, was it, somebody asked, uh, I think it was... Um, uh, Leonard's mom uh, asked, uh, was it Leonard's mom asked Sheldon, or Sheldon asked Leonard's mom something about why something happened to Leonard. And she said, you know, Sheldon, um, she goes, was that a rhetorical question or would you like to do the math? And he's like, I think I'd like to do the math. <laughs> so would I. And then they did the math. See, that's, you, that's a little funny. Yeah, right. That could possibly be pretty funny. I'm sure that Sheldon ruined the delivery. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, yeah, so moving past the French press screen door thing. Uh, <laughs> so punchline is it's because they didn't want to run cables out there. It's a cost-effectiveness thing. Um, but, you know, on top of that, if you have satellite-based Internet, uh, now we get back to the conversation we had earlier, which is uh, you could have decent bandwidth with a satellite-based Internet. So... You know, I think the, the, the best you can get with satellite-based internet today might be something like 12 or 15 megabits per second uh, download for satellite-based internet, but where you die with it is latency. 
So um, if you're out in the boonies and you're pr trying to play a video game with satellite internet, it's going to be very difficult. But you could probably stream Netflix. Because Netflix is just going to take you a little bit longer to start buffering because there's a the round trip, the amount of time it takes for your signal to go from your dish to space and back. Well, actually it goes dish to space to source to space, then back is time, right? So you might have a, a, a latency of 1,500 to 3,000 milliseconds. Um, so a 1,500 millisecond delay is one and a half seconds, let's say. So if you're playing a first-person shooter, and the time between when you say go left and when you actually go left is 1.5 seconds, you lose. It's equivalent to me. Play. That maybe makes it an even playing field to get, if you're playing against me in, in those games. Right, so that's a latency uh, issue as opposed to a bandwidth issue. All right, so now analog versus digital. And we could look at this. We'll keep our conversation about uh, the internet connection going on because, you know, that's of interest to us today. Uh, how many of you have ever had dial-up internet? Okay. Um, what, what speed was your dial-up? Just, just, just slow. Wasn't slow relative? Yeah, it is. So the fastest dial-up was like 56 kilobit per second. 56 kilobit <clears throat> per second. All right, so we do 56 divided by 1,024. That's 0 0.05 megabits per second. That's the speed of the internet connection. 0 0.05 megabit. Would the ping be a lot faster? No. no. Actually, ping would probably be slower. Yeah, not satellite dish slow, but slower than you would get over uh, a cable modem or DSL. All right, so dial-up. Um, so, you know, if you had the best dial-up modem, you could, the best you could do is maybe 56 kilobits per second. Um, but usually you'd actually connect at a speed slightly slower than that because you were actually using, this was prior to... Uh, um, well, at least commonly prior to TCP IP. Uh, this isn't a networking class, but have, it, have any of you had the networking class? Do you know what TCP? Do you know what TCP IP is? Do you know what it is? Or you just seen the see the words next to each other? I used it for my game. Okay. So, so do you, so do you? Can you tell me anything like about TCP IP? How they send packets? It's TCP or UDP, right? Those are the general ones. Okay. Yeah, the UDP is datagram packets. Yeah. Um, uh, how, like, is TCP like it sends it, and if uh, not all of it gets sent, it sends it again? Yeah, that, that's the punchline. So, TCP over IP, IP is a type of network. So, we usually think of an IP network being like an Ethernet network. But TCP effectively says when you send data, it's guaranteed to arrive because it resends if there's an error. All right. Well, before we had that, we had to come up with other solutions. And that was, uh, you know, anybody want to do an a, a impression of a dial-up modem? Okay, what's happening when it's doing that? It's a conversation between both of the routers. Ah, it's called handshaking. Yeah, yeah. And it's not routers, it's between the two modems. Uh, two modems. So they're handshaking. What are they? What, what are they? Uh, what are they trying to agree upon? Uh, well, what's the connection so you can pay? Uh, well, what's the fastest they can transfer data without screwing up? Okay, because they don't have TCP/IP to help them <laughs> to, to fix their mistakes. So they have to figure out what's the fastest they can talk to each other without messing up. So even though you have a 56k modem, we might be connecting to another 56k modem because of line noise on your analog connection. Uh, you might possibly have, uh, you know, you might only be able to get, you know, 38,600 38, um, bits per second, or 38.6 kilobits per second, something like that. All right, um, or uh, what is it? 38.6 divided by 1,024, so 0.03 megabits per second. Alex, not megabytes, megabits. It's an important. <laughs> yeah, I got it, megabytes. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, um, 
they're negotiating a speed. Well, dial-up is an analog technology. Well, I'll just say analog, so I don't want to have to spell technology. DSL is a digital technology, yet they both use the identical medium. They both use copper wires, the copper telephone wire. Identical medium. All right, so dial-up, we're going to say fastest is 56 kilobits per second, or 0 0.05 megabits per second. If we want to put it in today's numbers, they never talked about it in megabits per second because we, at that time, we thought that was an impossible speed. A megabit per second was impossible back then. Um, because you actually had a digital subscriber line. Well, you had a, a thing in the middle called ISDN. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, ISDN was a, uh, a dedicated line you can get from uh, uh, the, the phone company. And these would give you, uh, depending if you had the A and B channel, it would be 64 uh, kilobits per second or 128 kilobits per second. You know, those were the, it was crazy expensive. Um, so you might have paid five or six hundred bucks a month for uh, a sixty-four kilobit per second ISDN connection. Do you think the uh, internet connection at the Pentagon during the time was? Do you think they had a megabit? megabit uh, no, they probably back at this point in time. I'm guessing the Pentagon maybe had something like a uh, uh, a T T three maybe or a T one. So you should probably still hear that referenced yeah. in movies, right? Yeah. It's like, so would you rather have, well, it might be a bad guess there. Let's say you were getting your 60 megabits per second. Would you rather have that or would you rather have a dedicated T1 line to your house? Is T1, well, obviously T1. That's like, that's like what, that's like the best internet ever, always, forever. Okay, so I'm so glad he said that. Oh, man. Okay, so you've locked yourself into the T1. No. No, no, yeah, it could it's be done. T five. It's either T one or T five. You said Pentagon at this time had. Uh, you lose either way. That's best. You lose either way. Is T three the best? Uh, also, we're T three around there. Yeah. Well, no, their T three is three bundled T ones. Wow. So I want T five. Well, T one. So how much slower? Since I've already kind of given you the that that T one is slower than your sixty megabit. How much slower do you think it is? I have no idea. Uh. Synchronous, though. Upload and download speed. Wow. 1.44 megabits per second was a T1 line. Is a T1 line, even Still? today. Oh, yeah, even today. So a T3 is three times that. Yep. No. What? So what's the... What's <laughs> the what's I've been doing this a few today? minutes. <laughs> I live during this time. What's going to happen now? Um, Pentagon probably has something like maybe an OC12. Okay, so it's beyond T. And, and I might be... Uh, these are optical lines. Uh, fiber optic lines. It might even be higher than this. Maybe it's an OC48. I don't know. But it's a lot a lot higher. They're not dealing with analog lines anymore. Well, they're not dealing with um, copper lines. They're dealing with fiber. Certainly now. Um, but I, I like the T1 thing because they reference this They reference this in, in movies pretty often. You know, a dedicated T1 line or sometimes they'll say something like fractional T1. And because it's fractional, it's like, well, it must still be really fast because T1s must be basically infinity. It's infinity internet, right? Okay. It seriously blew my mind. I always thought that T1, T3, I was like, that's what kind of got right Well, that's what the, the geek shows want you to do. Because that's when... that's yeah, when that on the Big Bang Theory. That's when the Big Bang Theory ticks me off, is when they don't do their homework. They almost never do it. Yeah. They never, they're ever like, wow, that was actually accurate. Well, it, sometimes, yeah. But, but it's not something you could just look up on Wikipedia. Yeah, and right. No, and, and I agree with you on that. Yeah, especially like the, some of their World of Warcraft references. Because they, they've had several shows that have taught, referenced that game. Mm -hmm. It's always just made up stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah it's, that's, that's not in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, make up a game name. That might be the reason that I have so much wrong with it. Is it touts itself as a... The a smart, smart, reason? smart humor, but they, they lose out on the... Yeah, I get it. All right, yeah, so T1s are slower. Um, but I want to keep just these two guys in here. Uh, we're 25, not 20, right? Okay, we're good. All right, so dial-up, um, fastest we can get is 56 kilobits per second over dial-up. This is assuming the moon's aligned, 
it's a crystal clear <laughs> analog connection between the, you know, these are two modems sitting an inch apart. <laughs> we got the, the telephone line between the two of them, and it's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing there. <laughs> and we just got it insulated. So, so nothing's messing with this. So 56 kilobits per second. Um, and actually, it, uh, 56K was the, uh, that was the super fast dial-up internet. Uh, anybody know what the speed was right before 56K? 30-something. Yeah, 33-6. Okay, and before that you had 14-4. No, actually before that you had 28-8. Then you had 14.4, then you had 9,600, then you had 4,800, you had 2,400, you had 1,200, then you had 300 baud modems. Was that if you wanted to send a zero or a one to someone? 300 baud is bits per second. 300 bits per second. So that is 300 divided by 1,024 divided by 1,024. That's... 0 0.000286 megabits per second. So, your internet speed. There was slower than 300, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it started off before that. Yeah, so there was... Uh, Would that have been commercially... There was probably a 64 baud uh, connection. There was probably a 32. There was probably an 8 baud connection. And before that, they probably weren't sending anything. But... Uh, huh? Telegrams. Telegrams. <laughs> Guys on horseback. <laughs> Um, the the I remember three hundred baud modems. Uh, like that was had one. Yeah, oh yeah, wow. yeah. I'm a lot older than you. Yeah. At the time, you were like, "Wow, this is cool," or were you like, "This needs to get better." Uh, well, I mean, back then, I mean, the internet didn't exist. Sure. So what were you using? What was the coolest thing out? Uh, it was to like home networking. Having two machines talk to each other, yeah, it was like my hobby. I would build these uh, machines running different operating systems. So I had like a, um, uh, a Solaris operating system running on a Sun, uh, Sun Spark machine, and then I had like Minix, uh, another Linux operating system. I tried to get those guys talking to each other over an analog signal because a, uh, a modem is a modulator demodulator. So you have an analog signal between the two of them, and then this guy converts those analog signals into digital zeros and ones, which go into the computer because computers are... Digital. That was like my hobby. Are you sure you didn't use punch cards? <laughs> I use those as well. <laughs> uh, but I was just past uh, punch cards, though. So I have used punch cards, but as like a, this is how it was. Example, yeah, it wasn't, uh, yeah, because I started, I started programming when I was nine. And that was with Quick Basic on, uh, I think it was DOS 2? DOS 1, an early, very early DOS, running on an Epson computer uh, with an 8086 processor. Um, okay, so analog, fastest is 56 kilobits per second. Um, DSL, how many of you have DSL at home instead of, or, or versus cable? How many of you don't know if you have DSL or cable at home? Technologists should all know. Who's your provider at home? Who's your internet provider? Oh, you don't even know who sells it to you. So regardless of the technology, I don't know who gives it to us. Where's home? Okay. Oh, uh, do you know what the speed of your connection is? Well, the reason he doesn't know is it like fast, fast, or if he was paying for it, then he would. No, but his parents. He lives here. Okay, so that would be cable. If it's charter, it would be cable. Um, all right, so somebody said they had DSL? Okay, so you have uh, AT&T? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, what's the speed of your connection? 18 megabits. 18? Yeah. Oh, you must be like living next to the D-slam. It does well. Yeah, so uh, yours is through Uverse? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's about as high as you will ever see DSL, is 18 megabits. Um, I have no issues with it. Yeah, no, no, DSL is actually a good technology, yeah. but you are limited on your maximum bandwidth. Right. Okay, so DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line, and what it is, it's using an exact same piece of copper that dial-up is using. The exact same piece of copper as dial-up is using, but what it does is it transmits bits across that copper differently. You can actually, with DSL, you can make a phone call and have internet at the same time. Okay, 
With dial-up, somebody picks up the phone, disconnected. Now, sometimes you can get away with it. If mom picked up the phone, it didn't say anything. Just heard the beeping. Because remember, you know, back then you only had one phone line until I was on the internet 24-7s, and my way to get a second phone line. Um, phone lines are like 80 bucks a pop back then. You know, now at and just dying to sell you a phone line. Nobody wants land. Nobody wants landlines. Um, but uh, yeah, so as long as mom didn't talk, you had a fighting chance that she could hang up without the connection getting dropped, so that no errors were were introduced okay, over normal dial-up. Um, now uh, uh, DSL is using that same medium, that same copper, but they're representing the data across that copper differently. They're representing it as, as digital signals, it's like electricity going across there. All right. Um, now the fastest is let's say 18 megabits per second. You might find a place that advertises 24 uh, megabits per second, but realistically, most DSL is going to be something like 8 to 10 megabits per second um, because uh, DSL suffers from something called, it used to be called the final mile. Now it's kind of the final three or five miles where the farther you were away from the base station, uh, which is called the D-slam, uh, the, the weaker the signal was. Okay, so you couldn't actually get, uh, you could get the fastest speed if you like lived at the telephone company. You know, if you were like in the lobby, <laughs> you just plugged into the wall, then you could get your 18 megabits per second. Okay, so that's actually pretty impressive that you're able to get 18. Um, uh, although, you know, they've obviously got better at putting remote D-slams around because then what would happen is the companies that are selling uh, DSL, what they would do is they would have the home office, the phone company, and then they would have, you know, a bunch of D-slams within a mile of that, and then D-slams a mile out from that. So as long as you were close enough to one D-slam that could then repeat your signal in, you could get, you know, decent, uh, decent speeds. So we have a pretty big apartment complex area too, something like that. Yeah, so that's possible you have a D-slam right, right right in your area, right? Yeah. That's, that's entirely possible. Okay, so we have data representation over these guys. So now... Um, let's go this route. Just so we can get a little background in this. Um, for next class, let's write a two to three page on DSL versus cable modems. I want you to understand the difference between those guys. Okay? Because um, what we're about to talk about is how memory is represented. And we, in order to talk about that, we need to understand how zeros and ones are represented and how they're used. So that was that bad? No. You didn't want a paper? You no. Know. Well, I can make it three to five pages with that. For that. No? All right, well, what's this? <laughs> no. Single, single space, eight font. Just <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll see everybody.